opening day for the movie is October 7th, or obviously we have a, an extreme privilege to uh, view this all together tonight. And uh, honor for me to be here and be an executive producer on this film. Uh, my dear friend and uh, one of my high school classmates as well, Matt Budman, the producer. I just want to send my love to him. Uh, yes, and we are about to watch uh, an incredible, incredible film with an incredible, incredible cast. This is, uh, this is just a real moment. So I am here to uh, introduce the extremely talented, uh, very legendary, one of the most handsome men in Hollywood. He goes by the name of David O. Russell. executive produced this picture for us. We've been, we prepared the whole movie in their offices in Hollywood, and uh, we can't be grateful enough for all their support. He produced an incredible song for us in the picture with a beautiful artist, which we are very grateful for, which you'll see. I want to just want to get to the picture, so I'll keep it short. I'm going to thank Drake, Future. I'm going to thank Disney, New Regency, Assad at Disney. I want to thank Arnon Milchan, Yareed Milchan, Matt Bugman, Anthony Kataga, Sam Hansen, and I'd like to introduce our cast, uh, many of whom will stay afterwards to do some Q&As with Ben Stiller, my dear friend, and uh, De Niro's dear friend. So let's introduce, uh, bring up Tim Oliphant, folks. Andrea Riesboro. Michael Shannon. everybody about it who's here. So I'm just going to get everybody out here. First off, uh, Timothy Oliphant. Come on up. Andrew Rinsborough. Uh, Robbie Malik. Congratulate, how about a round of applause? <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, Christian and John David Washington uh, could stay. They have to work, and Bob and you are sitting up at 5 a.m. They're all going to work. Right. Um, John, he's in the, that is an August Wilson plan, John David. Yeah. Right. Um, so, First of all, congratulations on the movie. Congratulations on uh, being one of our uh, great American filmmakers. I love you, David. Uh, we, go, we go way back, and uh, I think uh, you are one of those filmmakers that is sort of beyond uh, category in terms of both what you do and, and the choices you make. There's like, there's a term of like, uh, Tour de France, Hot Pector, Hot HC, Hot Beyond category. That's like for difficulty, level, difficulty of the mountain. And I feel like you kind of 
are also willing to sort of take the chances to go for, you know, what might not be the easiest and not ever sit on the laurels and just make a movie that you can say, I'm not going to tell what the genre is, what it is, I'm going to make a movie where something is personal, and I'm going to put it out there for a mainstream audience and people can take it in and actually enjoy it as an entertainment and also be moved and feel something and think too. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my first question would be, is the film that we made together, Flirting with Disaster, your favorite movie? <laughs> if so, why? That's a, yes, it has a very personal place in my heart. That was my second picture. It was like a family reunion when I promoted this man's brilliant show, Severance, with Patricia Arquette and yeah. 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 It's been beautiful for us to reconnect. Yes, it's a very precious film to me. Thank you. Um, Thank you and good night. But, but seriously, <laughs> what I love about you is, and honestly, as a, as a filmmaker, so much of who you are comes through on the screen. Your energy, your feeling, uh, and you do something as a director to create something that's very unique. And I, I'm very curious about your process uh, overall, but I did just sort of want to start off because this movie is so unique from anything I think that you've done to talk about what was the impetus to make this movie. And I know it's been a long process, and it's incredibly relevant right now. A lot of the issues that are going on right now in our country and the world. But you started this process a long, long time ago. So if you, can you just talk a little bit about what was it that made you want to make this movie? What was like the inkling to start? Thank you, Ben. And uh, I, I will say that Christian and I started about five or six years ago wanting to invent an original character which we did with him. We wanted to be a doctor, we had a good friend, a dear friend, two dear friends. The kind of friendships we all wish we had, uh, that we'd go through anything with them together. And I think every member of the cast has that in some fashion, to have a, a partner or a friend that they would go through anything for. So we looked at history, we looked at big photographs of the Roseland Ballroom in New York, and you look at everybody dancing there, and you go, look at those two people. I never heard their story. I never heard their story either. Their best friends, they were in love. Who told their story? So we decided to tell their story, and we imagined backing into history if you had no clue what was going to come at you. And we found out history that we didn't know, and everybody we talked to didn't know. And we said, wow, this is like a, a powerful plutonium for the movie. And we started to build the characters, and I think the person who was in it the longest, other than Christian, and John David, who's here, who I'd love to speak, please, is Miss Margot Robbie, who was with us for several years. Sorry, yes. I, uh, I got to join the process a couple of years ago and had numerous conversations. I think everyone sitting up here knows that when you get a call from David or Russell on your phone, you turn to whoever you're talking to, you're like, I might just be five minutes or like six hours. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I could be right back. And, and it, it kind of began that way. And it, it began with conversations about art and friendship and love and history and the world today and the world back then and really mainly about art and friendship I mean as you can see that's kind of uh, more central for Valerie anyway but the process was incredible and, and and I don't know what the process was like for you back then but I don't know how David's kind of evolved as a director and writer since then but it, it's a completely unique experience. I think you can all attest to that. It's it's not like working with anyone else. And every day you go to set, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Literally, you don't know what you're going to shoot that day and most of the time, which is terrifying and also exhilarating and puts you in a place where you can really find a part of yourself as an artist and as an actor that you haven't tapped into before. And I think really that's David's gift that he's given all of us is he's helped us find these places that are out of house we've never asked to have. But for me, certainly, I tapped into places that I just hadn't really explored before, and it was because of this crazy, unique process that we all signed up for and dove in head first and had an amazing time experiencing together. And I want to I wanna give her credit if I could, because she was so brave. Everyone here was so brave. And we, it was like a bunch of musicians who wanted to play together. And no matter the size of the part, we all came together to play. And I'm so grateful for every single person up here and those who can't be here right now. Margot learned French. She learned to sing in French. She learned to make the art. 
She made the art in her house during the pandemic. We had two uh -huh. props. We were shut down. <laughs> She wrote manual about the great cinematographer. We looked at her art, and this was also made by a great visual artist in England called Linda Sterling, with Judy Becker, our designer. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's in the tradition of George O'Keefe, Hannah Hawk, um, and uh, Merritt Offenheim. And all these women who came out of the war made art that no one had ever seen before that had a sense of humor. It transformed tragedy into beauty and said, let's live for this and not think of other tragedies. So she takes the metal out of it. This is the story that fascinated Christian and I. Imagine these guys being bonded. There was a real doctor who joined that regiment because they wouldn't trust any other officer. And imagine being bonded in blood and meeting her and having the time of your life and thinking each of us should have a time like that. Uh, I loved Margot's gameness. I will say there was a screenplay. There was about 14 according to Christian's count. And then um, we could put it together in a novel. And thank you for your flexibility and your kindness and your trust. Everybody up here. Um, yeah, and that, that, I did, because I heard another uh, Q&A with you where you were talking about the process of developing the script, like multiple drafts over five, six years, pre, pre, uh, pre-current era. Pre era. So as it was unfolding, when, when was the last iteration of, uh, of the script and, and as you were finally getting ready to shoot the movie because things were happening, I'm sure, that at that point where you're, you know, you're saying, oh wow, the, the world is sort of, uh, you know, kind of, there's a confluence of events happening in terms of what the subject matter of the movie is and what's happening in the world. And did, you, did that affect the last part of the process when you're making the movie at all? No, we were going to make this movie no matter what because we were fascinated by history and these patterns. And then the world started to do freaky stuff. And we said, well, we're just going to stick with our story because we were here first. And, uh, and, so, and so was history. This is not the first time we've been here. And the movie should be an inspiration, and this character should be an inspiration. Um, you know. but, but, when you're make, but when you're making the movie, because what's fascinating to me is the movie's operating on a bunch of different levels. There's this emotional through line about, you know, about Bert and Valerie and this friendship with Harold and, and their connection, which is like the emotional, really, you know, the, the, the real base of the movie. As you're telling the story, are you worrying, just as a filmmaker, what are you thinking about when you're in the editing room, editing this movie? Because I, I talked to Mike White once who said, like, when he's in the editing room, he likes to just, he's looking for trying to find a feeling. He's trying to find, like, putting something together with music and editing to find something, a feeling. What are you going after when you're in the editing room with a movie like this? Because I know your previous movies, they have so much um, emotional energy, uh, but maybe the story isn't as uh, complicated, maybe, as this story, because it's in, in terms of, you know, what's happening on a, on a bunch of different levels. So what are you looking for in the editing room? Are you caring about the story? Are you caring about, are you thinking the emotion's going to be taken care of if the story's told right, or are you looking for something else? I don't, I don't know if that's well, a weird question. Well, it's a perfect question. I would say the vibe on the set is in the movie. Um, and as every time we hang out, that's the vibe. That, and so you want to follow the vibe. It's like a tuning fork we hit every day, right? We knew that these characters were authentic, and they'd be emotionally real, but also funny, like we like to make them, like we all talked about. So we knew we were telling this big dynamite piece of history, but we knew that what we'd care about is the three friends. And that, that you'd be most, that anytime we were with the three of them, the movie was electric. And then they meet these people along the road. They meet these two guys, and they're all layers of Valerie's world, or Harold's world. And uh, you know, these two are the layer of Valerie's world. These guys don't know. Robbie and Anya, who's in Australia making Mad Max, are, are layers of another part of her world. And of course, Beatrice is a layer of Bert's world, who's trying to figure out what love is, which I would argue half the population statistically is trying to do. And, um, and we have Mr. Tim Oliphant, who came to play and, and give us someone a change. I said, you're too handsome. Uh, and he made himself look a little freaky. Uh, I have to say, uh, the first showing, I didn't realize it was you, Tim, until, I think, after the that's movie. That's how we like it. When I saw him once upon a time in Hollywood, I didn't realize it either. So that's his special powers. Uh, but can I ask some of the actors, just talking about the process, Rami, Andrea, um, you know, this, have you guys, have you worked with David before? No, right? Um, yeah. So, what did you, you know, I, I remember when we worked together a long time ago, this feeling of sort of like, 
you know, intentional kind of chaos. And I, and I think that's intentional because you're trying to sort of shake up what might be the sort of normal thing you're supposed to do when you're making a movie where they put the slate out and you know action and everybody goes and sits in their chair and you want to get out of that in some way. That's my feeling, is that you're trying to just find something. What did you guys feel in terms of the process of working, working with uh, David? Um, oh, interesting. Um, I, f I feel so, I feel a bit crap saying this as well, but I so often feel um, not stretched to the fullest in cinema. Um, I find that much more in theatre, being propelled forward the way that uh, David kind of shoots a rocket up your ass creatively. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and my arms needed that. You know. I think, I think um, it's it's, a, it's an extraordinary and magical experience. Um, we've been talking about film all day today, and I was saying that it reminded me very much of making my first film, which was with Mike Lee. I and mean, in one of his films, for about two and a half minutes, I uh, prepared the character for seven and a half months. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and in that same vein, um, it's, a, it's a magical, unknown world that you step into, and there are very few directors who can create that for you. So it's a, it's a, it's a sure gift. Thank you, David. Thank you, Andrea. I've been a big fan of all these people for many years and talking to them for 10 years sometimes. Rami, what, tell me, because I, th I thought you were an incredibly, like, weirdly, like, weird, charming, some, like, likable, but awful uh, so, so <laughs> I would know but like what like what was, like what was your approach when you went in with David? like did you and David sit to talk about it did you get together and talk about it or did you work on a film with David you talk like uh, as I was like for hours and hours and hours and uh, it's it's a fulfilling experience because you feel his passion but uh, every day you just ask Christian, I said, you keep coming back. What is it? He goes, I never know what's going to happen on any given day, any moment. It's always a surprise, and that's thrilling. And i got to give a, a shout out to Mr. Stiller. Uh, we, my first film was with you, and uh, you took me under your wing. So yeah, yeah, that was going to be my first question actually to you was, was your experience tonight at the museum in some way responsible? <laughs> <laughs> And then, and, um, you're a great writer, and you guys are all great in this movie. Um, Mike and Mike, uh, like what a perfect band. My, we talked for years, and so did we show it. Well, yeah, we were talking, uh, we started out talking about it, and we kind of cross-faded into, into this thing. But, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's not often that you uh, find people that you enjoy just sitting and talking with as, as much as you do doing the work. Like, uh, I'd say there's one other director like that that I worked with, uh, Werner Herzog, where you just want to sit and talk to him because... They just know so damn much about the world, and they're so intelligent and well read. And, and every time I would sit and have lunch with you, I'd walk out of the restaurant going more than when I went in. And it's rare to, to find people like that. So thanks. Okay. Who's funnier, David or Werner Herzog? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what was like? What was your experience doing this? Because I mean. What, a, what an interesting character. Uh, I, I felt like uh, there was always something going on behind your eyes there that I didn't quite know. <laughs> um, it was one of the most thrilling experiences I've ever had. He's, he's, a, he's an auteur in the, um, in the classical French sense, and, uh, which means author. So, <laughs> uh, how means when you look down at that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, 
<laughs> You've come a long way. <laughs> that was an unbelievable. And to be able to talk at the top of your intelligence, the top of your reference level, and it just creates an unbelievable safe space. I felt like I could walk through a wall or walk on fire. And uh, yeah, I just felt safe and uh, loved. And uh, I know that sounds corny, but you, you want to, it's like a great coach that you want to, you know, skate your hardest for. Yeah, I think anybody who's worked with you sort of has that same feeling, uh, David. And I think it's because you open yourself up and you're very vulnerable uh, with yourself. With your, you know, you open up your heart. And, uh, and that's what the movie has so much of. And I, I think the optimism of the movie right now is you know, something that's really important. Um, I also think that um, you're, you're doing something that seems on the outside maybe simpler. To, like when you watch something like this, you created something that's based on a true story. How much of it is actually true? I'd say about 50 to 60 percent. Okay, but then you didn't really care necessarily about telling the story, uh, the, the true story, uh, beat by beat, factually. What was, or, or did you? What was more? What was the most important thing to you? In this to be with these three who fell in love with each other, and to, and to imagine the journey they went on, and to say they went through this together, and then they went through this together, and they got to meet all these. That, that's what it always was to us. I mean, like it's a piece of kryptonite when you have some piece of true history. The people don't know that we didn't know, everybody we talked to. So if you're keeping that through the ending. Myers knew from right away what he wanted the character to look like, from the hair to the eyes to the clothes, because he's a Britannica, he's a, his parents are from Liverpool, I think you should say something, Mike. And, 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 and his eyes are always into some avocation like birds for, for me, patterns of meaning of the world. So, and there's a true story about those bird guys. I was kicked out of the Bird Society of England for taking 24 eggs, which you were kicked out for. So, so please take it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, my parents are from Liverpool. I'm, I'm an English citizen and a Canadian citizen uh, and an American citizen. Um, and uh, I, I was in on the first conversation when we talked about um, democracy. And <laughs> I was like, wow, what an interesting big idea to take on, and uh, I think, uh, you know, it, 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 again, just being able to talk at the top of your intelligence and your reference level, um, yeah, I, I, I knew exactly who you, I think I hoped I did, what you needed, you needed a, a between us, a, a catalyst character of that sort of omniscience that often English people have. Uh, because they had so many years of empire. My dad used to, during the Vietnam War, he would shut the TV and go, yeah, you don't want to hop an empire to make it. work out great for you, like, uh, It's just that sort of royal navy knowledge of choke points and geopolitics. And uh, here I am on stage talking about that, and I'm like, Pinch me, dude, you know? Well, there's, there's always people who know what's going to happen in history 10 or 20 years before it happens. And I love reading about them. And then there's always people who know what's going to happen. And, it, and it's important, I think those messages are in the movie, you know, the history repeats itself because the dream forgets itself. Well, how, how, why else would you repeat certain things? You know, when they say, why would you take a perfectly nice teacup, says Matt, Matt, Matthias Jones, a beautiful thing, and make it into what looks like an instrument of violence, which Valerie's done with her scrap metal. Taken out of bloody men, and Christian says, "Yeah, that's a good question. Question of the century. Why would you ever do that again? Why would you ever have a war again? Why would you blow men full of men up? That women have to pull out of them, but you know, Rami and, and Rami. I love that everybody's an outsider in the picture. Even Rami was bullied by the prep school guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's your point to your point about opti optimism. I mean, that phrase at the end of the film, you know, history repeats itself." We, only ever heard uh, as a negative connotation, uh, genocide, atrocity, all these horrible things. And in this moment, it is returning to that beautiful place where you reckon with that, you know, the truest part of yourself when you had emotion, but you also had people who you could lean on and uh, uh, a relationship that transcended everything. And that, 
I, that's what you did, and it was so optimistic and powerful, and you, you changed that phrase for me and the That's well, but, and also, <laughs> I think also maybe that idea of, of, of history repeating itself because we forget, um, does that tie in, do you think, in any way with the drug usage in the movie? And I say that because people are doing drugs a lot in the movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be position. I mean, it's like it, there's somehow we like we cloud our minds and we like like Bird is trying to get through. He's a really good person, but he needs help, right? And I, what I love about it is if you don't in any way judge him as a character, he's just sort of. In fact, he's probably like the most open-hearted guy in the movie. Um, but and, and you know, he's also a drug addict. And I think the idea that we are sort of. We're, you know, we're living this sort of crazy, this sounds weird, but like this sort of crazy dream that we're all existing in here, we're repeating these mistakes over and over again, and our minds are you know, maybe not exactly clear. I don't know, there's something to me that's just all about the human experience, that is, you're operating on a lot of different levels, you're, you're, doing, you're putting a lot of different themes into the movie. I don't know if you even thought about that, you probably didn't. Well, I can tell you, that we knew it was an epic story. We knew it was about friends who've been friends for a a couple of decades who we find each other. We knew that soldiers then did not have, or anybody then, didn't have the medications we have now. So imagine having that pain or those injuries and not having any of the medicines we have now. So he's trying to invent them. And he would also sing a song. He had to, by choice, as Lincoln and Churchill said, I'm going to be an optimist because I don't see what I get from the other thing. Or the world will do that part for me, the draggy part. i got to be an optimist. So when London's being bombed, you know, when Churchill says, those are the people I want to hang out with which are all the people in this movie. Um, so do drugs have anything to do with forgetting? I think, I think the drugs help Bert live the life he wants to live, which drugs can do with mental health or anything. They can help you live the day so you're not paralyzed, so you're not stuck inside or in pain. And I think that's what, they did have advanced drugs overseas. There were eye drops that certain governments took every day uh, during the Second War that were super advanced. And, uh, I think you also show the disconnection of the super rich people doing the drugs and being totally, you know, in their own world, too. I just, um, I don't know, it's just very interesting. I watched it because I've watched it twice now. I think uh, there's so many uh, messages within the, in the uh, screenplay about that, even in early, like in the first act, where you basically say what's going to happen. We're, you know, we're, we made this basically said, like, we're going to forget, she says, we're going to forget the dream. I, you know, the dream forgets itself. And, and it's going to happen again. It's coming around, World War II. Um, and nobody wants to really believe it. And I think that's very relevant in our world right at this moment. So uh, I, I just want to say congrats on the movie. I love that you're always pushing yourself as an artist. You do something that very few people can do. And congrats to all the actors in this film. It's a joy to watch. Uh, David O. Russell, everybody.